Greetings from the Iranian Studies Unit of the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies. My name is Mehran Kamrava. My sincere apologies for our delayed start. My apologies to Professor Osan Lu and to our audiences around the world. Uh, some technical issues beyond our control. We're joined today by Dr. Arzu Osan Lu, who will discuss the criminal justice system and the victims' rights in Iran. Her lecture will explore some of the ethical and religious dimensions and the foundational logic underlying the law and motivating forgiveness work in Iran. Arzu draws from research conducted in Iran's criminal courts and archival and ethnographic research. Dr. Arzu Asanlu is a professor in the Department of Law, Society, and Justice, and she's also the director of the Middle East Center at the University of Washington. She's a legal anthropologist and previously worked as an immigration and asylum attorney. Professor Osanlu is the author of Forgiveness Work, Mercy, Law, and Victims' Rights in Iran, which was published by Princeton University Press in 2020. Congratulations. And the book won the Law and Society Association's Herbert Jacob Book Prize for New Outstanding Work in Law and Society Scholarship. Professor Osan Lu is also the author of The Politics of Women's Rights in Iran, also published by Princeton University Press in 2009. The book analyzes the politicization of women's rights and women's rights talk in Iran. She's published widely. I, we can go on and on about her publications. She has published widely in peer review journals and collected volumes. And she's currently working on a new project that explores the impact of sanctions on Iranians. Professor Asan Lu, thank you so much for joining us today and being part of our distinguished uh, lecture series. Before we begin, I'd like to remind our audience that they could submit questions through the Q&A function here on Zoom or uh, by commenting on the live stream posting uh, posts uh, of the event at the Arab Center's social media platform. Uh, it is an absolute pleasure uh, to have Professor Osan Lu uh, with us. And so without further ado, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to the um, Center and to the Iran Studies Unit. And of course, uh, Professor Kamrava and Hamid, thank you so much. Um, I, it's a pleasure to be here and I, I don't want to delay too much. I, um, I appreciate all of your attention. Um, so in my talk today, I, I am drawing from the book that just was published, Forgiveness Work, to explore the interplay between Shad, Shadiye, and the criminal codes in Iran as they relate to the foundational principles of mercy in Islam. Now, one of the sites um, where I carried out my field work was in the criminal courts in Tehran. And I would like to begin by talking to you about a court case um, where I was in court and after three and a half hours of trial, um, the case was coming to a close. And this was in August of 2016. A judge had texted me earlier in the week to say, come, this is going to be an interesting case. <clears throat> but so far, this was more of the usual. The chief judge brought the trial to a close by having the plaintiffs, that is the victim's family, who were the deceased's brother and two sisters, and then the defendants, who were the wife and two daughters of the victim, accept the charges of having murdered their husband and father by drugging him, then strangling him, then dismembering him with an electric saw before stuffing 
his body parts in large plastic bags with the intention of disposing of them, but then that's when they were caught. So back in the courtroom, after collecting the signatures, the case did finally take an interesting turn. Seemingly out of nowhere, the chief judge looked at the packed courtroom. He looked at both sides of the room and said to the parties, I think you need to talk. The judge proposed to clear the courtroom of spectators to allow the parties to discuss the conflict. So at that moment, the chief judge with the two associate judges stepped out of the role of the trier of fact to that of the mediator, Mianjigar, we say in Persian. So they would hold a reconciliation meeting, Jalaseya Sol, between the parties aiming to avoid the imposition of the harshest sentence, of course, which is resas or retribution. And in this case, this would be death. So at, just at the mo moment they were about to start the reconciliation hearing, the judge said, I take no sides in this case. And he turned to the victim's family and said, you're right, to resource is preserved by law. But I want you to consider something. Every murder has a reason. Now to those of us who had sat for the three and a half hour trial, we knew that this was a reference to the letters that the victim, uh, sorry, that the perpetrators had submitted to the judge and they laid out in detail the victim's violent behavior, which consisted of years of beatings and verbal and yes, physical abuse. The judges said that the victims who were his siblings, right? Um, he said to them, I recommend that you read the letters your nieces have written. So finally, with the room cleared, the judge repeated what he had said at the beginning, at the end of the trial. He said, everything is over. And this is the start of the reconciliation meeting. And the judge's statement pronounced a move from the non-discretionary judgment to the discretionary phase of reconciliation. So this, the statement was really breaking the trial phase of the judgment phase to the reconciliation where the judge is now the Mianji Gad. And the vi victim's family, they were very, very reluctant. They said, look, we're not ready to execute. They're talking about their sister-in-law and their nieces, but right now we are exploding with grief. The judge said, you know, we don't want to hear this again. They had talked about this during the trial. He said, our duty in all of our cases is to arrive at a reconciliation. I want to ask this of you, that you try to find a solution between you. Now, this case was interesting to me because it seemed to me that this is the hardest place to forgive. And yet, with the judge's opening of the reconciliation meeting, the prison guards shepherded the nieces to go and plead. They fell on their knees. They put their heads at the feet of their aunts and they cried out for forgiveness. And the, the, at first the aunts looked away, they said, why should we be mercy when they were not? Why should we be merciful? The onlookers, which included journalists and social workers and myself, played the role of a Greek chorus. We sang the rewards of mercy and compassion. One said, by forgiving them, you will release yourselves. By killing them, you won't receive God's mercy. 
But the, the siblings persisted. They said, our brother didn't do those things. They're lying. Now the judge, he spoke loudly over the others. He said, but in your, with your mercy, you'll be helping them become better people. Now, one thing that became evident was that the judges had read the detailed letters of abuse and they probably were somewhat persuaded by what the perpetrators had said in those letters. And while the letters were sympathetic to the girls and their mother, they carried no legal weight. And the women had no evidence for their claims. So their only space to maneuver was to convince the victim's family to forego the sauce. <clears throat> to address the family's concerns with honor, you know, the claims that they made, the victim, the perpetrators made. One of the judges called over a journalist and asked the journalist to write an article in the next day's paper. And he said, do, it, do an interview with the defendants and just say, we made a mistake. Just that, no more. That statement had to be ambiguous. It would give relief to the besmirched honor of the deceased and the family of the deceased. And yet it would not suggest that the perpetrators lied. So with a bit more cajoling and celebratory praise for their compassion, mercy, and humanity, the family agreed to forego Ressas. Now, it, many of us know that the press, that in the media, we know from this that Iran's criminal justice system is a harsh one. It had the world's highest rate of capital punishment per capita. But most of those executions were for drug convictions. And in 2018, a new law passed that would and has reduced many of those offenses. Now, after Iran's revolutions, the, the leaders rewrote the national laws to conform with Islamic principles, the Shad, as they saw them. And many revisions to the criminal laws um, were only finalized in 2012, that's the substantive penal code, and then 2015, the code of criminal procedure. When these codes were finalized, they also codified for the first time the possibility of the plaintiff's forbearance. And of course, this is derived from the Muslim mandate to be merciful and compassionate. I'm not saying this never happened before, but I'm saying that this was codified in the, the written law at this time. So the criminal code made retribution literally the right of victims' families, that is victims as plaintiffs in criminal cases, they're private plaintiffs, can demand that the state carry out retributive sanctioning on their behalf, or the plaintiffs can forego it. And the code of criminal procedure, moreover, creates a duty on the part of judicial officials to help the parties reach a settlement. Now, despite these legal and moral obligations, there are few legal regulations to guide the parties on how to bring about a re reconciliation. So in the book, I argue that the tension between this duty to forgive next to, alongside a purposeful absence of guidelines on how to forgive, actually produces a social field that somewhat autonomous, semi-autonomous social field of forgiveness work. It's an advocacy marketplace that commoditizes forgiveness and it spurs, creates new avenues for uh, negotiating reconciliation. And in the four decades since these laws have been in effect, numerous groups and individuals governmental, non-governmental, 
have intervened in murder cases that they have nothing to do with in an attempt to bring about reconciliation between victims and their perpetrators, and moreover, to change the culture from the ground up. So in my book, I examine what I see as an emerging social movement for forgiveness, aimed at saving individuals from execution. And, and I do this through, um, Mehran mentioned, an ethnographic study that focuses on who forgives and how and why they do this. I've been working, I had been working on this project starting in 2007. I conducted participant observation in Tehran's uh, criminal courts. And I've been following the activities of many social actors, including lawyers, defense lawyers, judges, prosecutors, social workers, even some celebrities, actors, renowned athletes, um, as well as these victims and perpetrators' families who all have been working to achieve forbearance, what I call forgiveness work. And that's the title of the book. In the first part of the book, I look at this, the criminal justice system's legal apparatus. In the second part of the book, I explore what I see as the life world of forgiveness. I want to examine the lives, the work, and the attributes of some of the uh, social actors who are involved, who comprise this forgiveness work, if you will. But one thing that became very important that almost all of my interlocutors mentioned is that by trying to you know, change the culture from the ground up, what they are doing is cultivating what they call a feeling of forgiveness. And I was interested to know what that looks like, what that means, both to the victims, but also to the social workers themselves. So back at the trial, at the end of the reconciliation process, just as we were filing out, I asked the judge why he convened that meeting. How did he know to do that? And he replied, it's my duty. And then he said, it's in our laws and our religion. Now, I heard this response quite a lot, but it's very interesting coming from an Islamic Republic that the judge, who's an officer of the law of the courts, would separate the law and religion as two distinct duties. Um, I spoke a lot to the judges about the motivations for this kind of work that they did because there was a concern with being impartial as well. Um, and one judge who was actually in the implementations unit, Ejray Ahkam, the, the, the unit, once the case is over, the file goes to that implementations unit to see that the case can be literally prepared for execution. But this judge told me that there are many motivations and they come from our religion, the rituals of our culture. And he says, we draw on these resources to what we refer to as restorative justice. Now in Persian, he gave me the term idolate tarmimi. And I say that because many, many Iranians, even Iranians living in Iran at the time said to me, I'd never heard of that word. Now, restorative justice, but they've heard of sol, right? Sol and sazish. But idolate tarmimi, they hadn't heard of. And I'd be interested to know if our, our audience today, you have familiarity with this term. Restorative justice is part of what happens in these cases. This is the judge talking. He says, there are even some who want our current system to be replaced by it. Others say that restorative justice should come before any qissas. And it's also in the Quran and in the ahadith. They all say reconciliation is better. This is the judge, I'm continuing quoting the judge. And he continues, he says, but there's also the human perspective. We have to consider the rights and the suffering 
of the family. So we in the court acting as judges need to be impartial during the proceedings until the decision is issued. Then afterwards, we can ask the family of the victim to think of forbearance and to be merciful. And I think it's important to add that the official mentioned that, the, you know, the form, that it, it, the sources the official mentioned um, are what many Iranian jurists, legislatures, judges understand to be immutable religious prescriptions, right? Um, so I was interested to examine the sources further of, the, of what motivates judges, but also my other interlocutors who say it's in our culture, it's in our religion to work for Sol. How does an Islamic ethics operationalize forbearance? Um, and of course, you all know, mercy and compassion are foundational and indeed constitutive of an Islamic concept of justice. The Fatih opens the Quran, the Bismillah leads all but one of the Quranic chapters. Indeed, stories of just compassion abound within the Quran, the Ahadith, and the commentaries. The Maryam chapter highlights the Abyssinian king's mercy towards refugees and also serves as a foundational understanding for what it means to be merciful. For the Shia, of course, the example of Ali's good works serve as a constant reminder, particularly from his famous letter on just governance to Malik al-Ashtar when he was appointed the governor of Egypt. To Ali's, Hazrat Ali's stories of magnanimity in battle, in the battle of the trench, to his anonymous acts of generosity recounted in Iran's and other popular media and in compilations such as Dostan Rastan, the narrations of the voracious by Ayatollah Mutahari. Back in the Maryam chapter of the Quran, which tells the story of Maryam in detail, the word God is repeatedly referred to as Al Rahman, the compassionate, the symbolic meaning of the only chapter of the Quran named for a woman is also an important gendered consideration, which I'm happy to talk about in the questions. But in that chapter also, an important passage addresses forbearance and suggests that those who express leniency through merciful acts will be recognized and rewarded in death. The passage also evokes God as the ultimate writer and wrong, of wrongs and implores believers to leave punishment to the divine. And of course, many scholars um, have looked at the ethical religious code of Islam that guides social relations. And I, I'm just going to skip ahead there in the interest of time, but what these scholars argue is that Islam's ethical religious code creates a, a habitus, a way of being for Muslims. In other words, it's a system that structures a dialogical call and response of mercy as forbearance in these qissas cases. The legal system now draws on this ethical religious system and structures a hierarchical power relation between the grantor of forbearance and the aspirer to have it perpetrators. In this context, how the plea is made, what facts emerge, and how they are revealed and made public all matter. And this is what I learned when I started watching these reconciliation meetings. These are all built into um, the system, and they actually precede the legal codes that value reputation and honor and need to find a way 
to recalibrate and reinstate the lost honor of the deceased and the family of the deceased. Now the Quran, I, I just made the case, strongly encourages forbearance. And now these scriptural compulsion has found its way into Iran's criminal laws. And it distills them as a prescriptive codified law. As I said, both in the uh, substantive criminal law and in the criminal procedure. And I don't think enough people work on procedural criminal law. It's, it's very important for, because how the case flows it can be determinative. Um, of course, as state law, preserving the right of re retribution serves many purposes. It maintains the sovereign monopoly on legitimate violence. It gives injured parties a sense of power in their right of retribution. And some argue, but many uh, argue against, it halts the cycle of violence. Now, the way the Islamic Republic of Iran does this is an interesting balancing act between maintaining the monopoly over violence, but at the same time, granting individual victims the right, which they believe through the interpretation of the Shah cannot be appropriated by the sovereign. So the case that I just mentioned is a good illustration of this balancing act. On the one hand, the judges preserve the right of retribution, but in this case, especially when there were clear problems, although those problems were hearsay and not admissible in court, um, the law allows the judges some discretion, not with presas, there's no discretion in that sentencing, but we do see discretion in the post-sentencing reconciliation. And this is precisely where the new legal codes add emphasis. They're moving the judge's vague and somewhat imperfect duty to reconcile to arguably an affirmative one. That's what the codes do, the code of criminal procedure. And they stress, moreover, that the sentence is not resas so much as a right to resas. And this suggests to the family of the victim that they don't have to exercise that right. The right is the right of resas not Ressos itself. And with that, the right of Ressos also comes what? The right of forbearance. So many social workers emphasize that forbearance is also a right that the victim's uh, family has. Now this constraining of Ressos and the enlarging, if you will, of reconciliation in the codes doesn't come solely from retribution. But in Iran's criminal code, and this is something that the judges and many prosecutors and defense lawyers have said to me, is the problem with the definition of intent. The definition for intentional murder is overly broad and it catches many situations which may not in other jurisdictions be defined as intentional. So in the discussion above, I wanted to highlight this informal regulation of forgiveness work. But in the remaining time, I want to draw on another case that underscores how the scriptures themselves are operationalized to inspire individual forbearance. So before I was talking about how the scriptures are codified and the codes inspire workers. So uh, the judges, for instance. Now I wanna look at individual forbearance that is inspired by the principle, if you will, to amr b'maruf. And I know that's an Arabic phrase, you don't have to translate that. And this is um, a case where the head of the implementations unit, so this case had already been decided and the head of the implementations unit invited me to come one day. He said, there's a good case for your research. Um, and this case involved an incident that had taken place three years earlier. Two young men 
both in their early 20s, had gotten into a fight. One, Ihsan, threw a knife at the other, at Ali Khalili, and injured him in the neck. And this is an example of how overly broad the definition of intent is, right? Now, Ihsan did not um, kill Ali. He was injured, um, but Ihsan was charged for the bodily injuries he caused Ali. Of course, in these kinds of cases, it's the, the punishment is to pay a die. Um, but there was also three years in prison for Ihsan for the tort crime. And I can talk about the distinction there in the question and answer. Um, but Ali and his family, who were very pious and members of the Basij, they went one day, this is again, this is three years ago, to the Dodzara, to the court, and announced their forgiveness. And this resulted in a reduction of Ihsan's sentence. But this is not where the case ends. As I said, Ali was a very pious man. And after this incident, after his injury healed, he goes on to make the Arba'in pilgrimage on foot, barefoot, from Najaf to Karbala. And he does this twice. But Ali also has a genetic blood disease. And his doctor had warned him not to make that pilgrimage. Now, the second time he came back from the pilgrimage, he was very sick. And unfortunately, he died. This was three years later. Ihsan had just been released from prison. Now the doctor examining the deceased, who now referred to Ali as Shahid, indicated that the injury was not a direct cause of death. However, it could not be ruled out as a contributing factor. So based on this, legal physician's assessment, Ihsan, who now is 24 and had just been released from prison, is rearrested and this time charged with intentional murder because the physician who examined the body found that the injury could have been a contributing factor to his death and the sentence now is Ihsan's. So the day that I was called by the judge to come to the implementations unit, the Ejroi Ahkam, I was surprised I saw journalists, at least from five different newspapers, standing outside waiting to inter interview this family. And the story was covered by the Iranian press. And in the newspaper, one of the newspapers, Shar, noted its headline, Ali Khalili, Family did Amr Maruf. I was very surprised. I did not see this coming, I have to say. And I had not heard people using this phrase Amr Maruf to um, talk about forgiveness work. So the family forgives a, a second time. And in a widely published letter, Ali's mother wrote a statement giving us some insight. And she says, I'm just gonna quote the letter a little bit. Our darling dear son, with the blood of your vein, the scent of defending the space of honor of our Islamic society, once again, life has been taken. And with the blinded spite of our internal and foreign enemies, the rich Islamic culture and the duty of Amr b'Maruf b'Nahi as Munkar, you have been damned as an icon, a symbol of the restoration of this forgotten obligation. Your face generously gave its blood, your sacrifice for, and forbearance for these unforgivable errors. 
but you showed the perfection in your short life. And the letter goes on in this style, which was published in its entirety by the press. Now, what struck me again was the invocation of the Amr bin Ma'ruf. Um, now, a uh, scholar of Islam and Islamic law, Michael Cook, in his book of the same name, charts the history and origins and development of this principle. And I draw on Michael Cook, not because he's a US professor or because he wrote in English, but because when I went to Qom and I interviewed one of the Hojatul Islam there about my project, he told me I should look at Michael Cook's book. Just as an aside, he did call him Michael Jackson, but I think that was a mistake, but he was referring to Michael Cook. And Cook's commentary of the modern use of this principle includes a survey of its use in Iran. Um, and he spoke with a number of clerics, including Muhammad Baghir Hakim, who said that this principle shows the superiority of Islam in providing guarantees of human rights. And Cook goes on and tells us that this principle is found in the Quran and in eight specific verses. But he says the two phrases, Amr Ma'ruf and Ahiyaz Munkar, are rarely found independently of one another. Um, while the book is looking at what scholars have said, Cook also explores what, what is it, the actual character of the duty. And I have to say, most of the 700 page book is about the second part, not Amr Ma'ruf, but Nahi Az Munkar. There's much less about what Amr Ma'ruf means. So Cook says, well, it's an appeal to the community of the believers, but there's no real indication of what concrete activities are subsumed under the rubric of Amr Ma'ruf. So he says it's a broad, ethical affirmation to the community or to the world at large. And it's by no means clear. So because it's not clear, he moves and says, I just want to look at what does Amr Ma'ruf mean? And he looks, he says Ma'ruf means what is right or appropriate. And he looks at chapter two, verse 178, which is also one of the important verses that talks about forgiveness or forbearance, af. And he uses this term to suggest that maruf, you know, isn't always happening in legal contexts. It's not even a legal term. And it really refers to the performing of an action in a decent and honorable fashion. But what conduct it's referring to, he says, we don't know. We just have to look at the standards of behavior within that society that are already established. And he says, of course, in the Quran, commanding good, Amr Ma'ruf, always includes, you know, praying, paying alms, believing in God, obeying God, and um, so on. But he says there's nothing specific. So kind of picking up where he has left off, um, scholar, Kevin Reinhardt has also explored the term, just the term ma'ruf, which we know literally means what is known. I just got a message to conclude, so I'm, I'm just about to conclude. So what we know is that this suggestion to, is to do what is right, what is good, and what is kind. And the Quran assumes that some part of that is already part of ordinary knowledge. So there's a normative quality to forbearance. And that's really what I want to say in closing, that the judges and the social workers are drawing on when they say we have our own rituals, is this ordinary aspect of forbearance, that it is embedded in multi-layers, but it is part of the ordinary. And Islamic law, in this sense, that I've shown is not just something that is ossified, but is always in the process of becoming. Um, and it draws from 
these multiple sources to animate the sources of the ordinary, ordinary culture, ordinary rituals to animate the sacred texts. So I'll end there and hopefully we have a little bit of time for questions. Thank you so much for your interest and attention. Thank you so very much, Arzu. That was just absolutely terrific. And uh, I think I speak for everyone where I say we could just sit here for hours and listen to you. This is really fascinating uh, research that you've done and um, uh, it's absolutely terrific. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the access? How did you go about getting access to the court system? And uh, seems like the judges were quite open in, uh, giving you access in the two examples you mentioned. Sorry, you're muted. Sorry, as I said, I started the project in 2007 and I really thought it would just be a textual project. Um, but it just so happened that there was the, the process of finalizing the criminal code was going on at this time. And I said to the judges, um, you know, uh, I, you know, I found a few friends who knew, you know, prosecutors and defense lawyers who knew judges, and they brought me into the criminal court. And of course, I had to get the permission of the, the judge who oversees the court. And I have this kind of suspicion around me all the time. Are you a human rights activist? Are you a journalist? What are you? Who are you? What are you doing? And I said, look, everybody, and, and this is in one of the comments that said I was very biased, everybody knows how harsh, how severe the, the criminal justice system in Iran is. And I said this, you know, Amnesty International, Human Rights, all these organizations have already said all this. So what, if I were to do that, that's not new. That is just reporting. But one thing, because I practice law in the United States, and I know that the role of victims, families, is very limited. It's almost mute. So I wanted to really compare that. And I think the reason I got access was because the judges saw that I had a, if you will, social scientific interest in the study. And it, it wasn't just to, to kind of show the, you know, in a biased way, the bad. And in fact, you know, this is the answer to the person who said I was very biased. The judges said to me, tell the good, tell the bad, just tell the truth. And, I, and what I want to say is that all those things that you know about the, you know, Islamic Republic system, that's what you know, but this is also happening over two thirds of murder cases end in forbearance, but we don't hear about that. So that also needs to be stated, that happens as well. So I ended up getting access, I think, it, it, by you know telling people what my project was. Right, right, that's, uh, that's uh, terrific. Have you done any comparative work? Uh, by the way, I should mention, incidentally, and I'm so, I didn't want to interrupt you, but for some time now, we've had Arabic translation uh, available. And so uh, if our uh, listeners or viewers go to the uh, uh, bottom of the Zoom screen where it says uh, languages or shows a um, globe, if you if they click on Spanish, then they uh, will get the Arabic uh, simultaneous Arabic uh, translation. Um, Arzu, have you done any uh, or have you given any thought in, in terms of comparative work between Iran and other Muslim majority cases where there might be some similarities? Uh, or is Iran unique in this sense of having codified uh, forbearance and, uh, and, and forgiveness? You know, I have not done comparative work, but I know people who are also doing this kind of work. Um, there's a French Algerian uh, legal anthropologist, uh, Yazid Benoune, who has looked at the Sudan, he's looked at Algeria, he's looked at some other uh, Muslim majority countries in North Africa. Um, and there was a, so, so many Muslim majority countries have so, some variation of this. Very few of them, none to my knowledge, to be honest, 
actually give the family of the victim the right to ask for execution. Indeed, there was a very interesting case in Pakistan only a couple of years ago of an honor killing where a brother killed his sister. And it shockingly, it was the parents that wanted the most severe sentence against their son. And um, the, because of that case, the law changed to remove the death sentence for these kinds of killings. So he got life imprisonment, but um, these are, are very um, difficult and upsetting cases. Um, so, so to answer your question, there's a variation on them in many societies, not just Muslim majority, because a lot of this actually comes from pre-Islamic sort of tribal. Um, I know, for instance, I know in China, I, I had a friend whose father was hit by a car and it was, uh, they needed to forgive the perpetrator. So these things also uh, take place in other jurisdictions that are not Muslim majority, um, but not, I'm not aware of any, any um, this is what I call it an extreme victim's rights perspective. So I'm not aware of any other jurisdictions where the family of the victim has the right to ask for ressas and the state will carry it out. Thank you. Uh, you alluded to uh, the next question, uh, but it um, uh, one of our uh, audience members has asked in terms of um, the, the discretion that judges have in um, kind of uh, in, in rendering the final judgment, does this not lead to personalization of the criminal legal system? Yes, it does. I mean, uh, the, it's... Uh, you know, this is one of the things that I thought was really interesting, and I write about this in my book. Um, um, a lot of my lawyer friends in America said, wow, like, because just the whole idea for an American lawyer, right, the idea that the victims have this important role is quite striking. And um, they said, this is really, um, this could cause all kinds of inequality before the law, deal making. And I, I said this, I went back to Iran and I said, you know, what about this inequality before the law and the, and the deal making that goes on? And they said, well, how is that different from the American system? And the, they brought out the execution of the, a man who had an IQ of 70 who was executed in Virginia. And, you know, if you look at the history of the death penalty in the United States, the lynching of, of African Americans, you also see that this similar kind of inequality before the law and personalization goes on. This is why I think looking at criminal procedure is very important for those of us who follow American law. There's a very important murder case being tried in our courts today, the, the trial of a, a white American young man, Kyle Rittenhouse, who killed several people in a anti-racist um, protest march. And if you look at the judge's rulings, he won't let in certain kinds of testimony or evidence that, so that the jury can't hear certain aspects of the state of mind. And so this also creates a different way to understand the case. So back to, I think it's uh, Professor Vatandu's question that you're referring to. Which That's right, I, yes. I do want to address because I think it's really important. So the, what the judges, it, it's really interesting. So in criminal law or in law, you have what's called strict liability crimes. Crimes where, and this is in all jurisdictions, America, France, wherever, where you just have the crime and you have the penalty. And if the, it's proven, then the judge has no discretion. And Ressas is one of those. So Ressas, it, if it's proven, the judge has no discretion but to render Ressas verdict. And I had a lot of social workers, even lawyers say to me, this system in Iran, they said, can you believe this system? The judge gives Ressas and then turns around and tells the people to forgive. Well, the reason for that is what I said in my talk, that the definition of intent for intentional murder, which, which gives the punishment of at the end, intentional murder, uh, resource, is extremely broad. 
So they don't have the degrees that we do. And I know people are working on this as a revision to the law, because in the Khalili case that I mentioned, you know, throwing a knife at someone wouldn't necessarily be intentional murder. It would be maybe second degree or manslaughter in many jurisdictions. So that in and of itself is the problematic dynamic that needs to be um, addressed. And um, so, so I can say much more about the judges. Um, I, I have a whole chapter on the judges. I, you can read it. But I want to say one last thing about the, the, the law about the eight, under age 18. Um, because Iran is a party to the Convention on the Rights of the Child, this is where this forgiveness work actually begins in my mind and in my book. Because in 1994, Iran passed that law, they're required under that treaty, which by the way, the US has never signed, to have NGOs to help support the rights of children. And those NGOs started to um, you know, ask for reforms in all areas, but in particular, this law for executing under 18. And that law changed. It didn't change that no children, nobody under 18 will be executed. But now there are a number of procedures in place, including a, a, an extra, they create a, a, a under 18 tribunal, a child court or whatever, but they also have the assessment of two social workers to um, examine the state of mind, the, the state of maturity of the youth, to basically to determine if the youth can stand for trial as an adult. So they have put some impediments in place for executing under 18. Um, and I should say in the first case I mentioned, one of the youth, one of the young people, the, the girls who participated in killing her father was under 18 and, and this all uh, played out. Uh, thank you. What is the, um, sorry, uh, just one more question, if I may. I know you're, you're, you're tired and uh, it, this is really truly fascinating. Uh, or actually two more questions. First, can you say a, a little bit about the training of the judges? Uh, what's their background? What, uh, what is their training, uh, the, the work in terms of the research you've done? The, the training of? The judges. Well, you know how, you know, to become a judge, it's a civil servant position. And it's very similar in other countries with civil legal systems. They have to take a test. Now, what's interesting, and I argue in the book, because of this discretion um, to work on reconciliation, of course, those who are trained in sort of the, the ethical principles of Islam are much better equipped to do this kind of work. But we should also note that in Iran, they have a panel of three judges, whereas in the US, it's just one judge. So there's a lot that goes on. I sat in after the um, rendering sort of of the Ressas verdict, or, or I'm sorry, before the rendering of the verdict. So where the judges actually debate, is this Ressas, is this intentional murder? Um, and I saw the ways in which this plays out. But uh, so there are judges who very, some judges only went to Islamic cemetery, seminary, some judges went to university, some judges went to both. This, the chief judge in the first case I mentioned was actually a judge from before the 1979 revolution. There are a number of judges who are on the bench as chief judges who were judges before the 1979 revolution. One judge even showed me a picture of himself with his tie and he was all proud. So there is a lot of this kind of thing that, that goes on. Uh, perfect. And uh, so um, uh, one of our, um, there's, uh, I suppose there's a lot of potential for abuse of Amr Maruf and Nahya Is yes. Is that correct? Just yes, to, I wanted to say that and uh, this is something I took out of the talk. Um, we started a little bit late. What, one thing that's really interesting to me was that 
the, you know, I said I had never heard Amr ben Aruf associated with the forgiveness work of, of my interlocutors until this Khalili case. And this Khalili case coincided with an event that took place in Esfahan where the young women had some acid thrown in their faces. And, it, and in response, people said that this had to do with a bill that was circulating in parliament and Amr Maruf built to make it a law, to make kind of like civilian vigilanteism the law. And um, you cannot escape the, the, you know, the political sense that there's a relation here when the newspapers are called, and this is front page. The the, the you know the journalist from uh, the re researcher from USA is called to watch this, and it is, um, you know, something problematic. I mean, even this happened to me myself when I was uh, traveling somewhere in Iran, and a, a man came and said something to me about my attire, and I said, you know, who are you? And I complained to the person in charge and the man said, well, we're told to do Amr Maruf. <laughs> <laughs> so this is one of the, this was kind of like a rippling effect of this. And so this is, uh, um, yes, there, there is some politics yeah. around the, the Amr Maruf. This is absolutely fascinating. I'm really, truly grateful to you. And uh, you've done really uh, a, a huge, uh, a huge uh, favor. I think uh, having you is a feather in our cap, huge feather in our cap. And I'm really, truly grateful uh, for, uh, for the talk. Uh, just one last question. You're currently working on a book on uh, the impact of sanctions on Iranians. Um, would you be kind enough when the book is uh, finished and published, uh, uh, would you be kind enough to come back and talk to us about the findings of that book also? I would be delighted. Thank you. And thank you for your time and your interest and your excellent questions. Well, and if there are people, you know, if I didn't have a chance to answer your question, please feel free to reach out. Uh, I'm, I'm very interested to, to hear your responses. Thank you so much. Thank you. As someone who has done field work in Iran myself, I know how absolutely difficult uh, it is. And it, it takes a lot of patience and a lot of hard work. And uh, you are one of those uh, rare scholars who does field work and uh, does not just field work, but original uh, path breaking scholarship. And we're all the better for it. So thank you so very much. Uh, truly appreciated and Thank my sincere so thanks uh, to our audiences here in Doha and around the world and again apologies for our late start my apologies to you Professor Osan Lu and uh, we'll see you again very soon next time good Thank evening you so much. Thank you Thank you